There's the seven wonders of the world. The Great Wall of China, for example, will be one. Over 13,000 miles long. The Colosseum of Italy, great oratorium of Italy, can seat over 80,000 people at the one time. The Taj Mahal of India, and Dixon will be glad to hear that. Believe it or not, this, the Taj Mahal of India cost in the region of £589 million in today's currency to build. Great wonders of the world. Then there's the, the pyramids in Egypt. And then there's the Christ the Redeemer in Brazil, overlooking the cities there. You know, the great pyramids of Egypt were a wonderful height at the time. They were over 481 feet high. But through time, that has dropped quite a bit. Because of erosion and other causes, they have sunk quite a bit. But you know, this morning I want to think about something that's far greater than any of these things. Something that time will not erode. Something that time will not change. Something that we cannot damage. Something that is sure and steadfast. And that is our God. I want us to consider verse 28 and 29 in particular. Now this is a rhetorical question that the prophet is asking here. And uh, as God speaking through the prophet, he says, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might to increase his strength. I want us this morning just to consider our perception of God. Psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 48, verse 1 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. The children of Israel, uh, before this passage was written, had lost their awe and their wonder of God. They had, they had lost their awareness of God's greatness. They had forgotten what God had done for them. They had forgotten what, where they'd come from. But you know, they, had, they still had a, a perception of God. Everyone has a perception of God. I can remember one time when I was doing some outreach in Lisbon. I handed a leaflet to this, this man and he, uh, we got into conversation. He says, no, I wouldn't be interested in that because I'm a, an atheist. So we got into conversation then for a while and the conversation developed. And he did accept that there was a God. But he says, that God has nothing to do with me. And I have nothing to do with him. And he says, That's, I just leave it at that. So in a way, he had a perception of God. The sinner, the world in which we live, and uh, us as Christians, I wonder what is our perception of God. As Christians, do we realize the wonder and the amazement that God, the God of the God that we have? This God is the God of the universe. And as Christians... Down through the years, uh, theologians and uh, people have sought to uh, describe God and, and lay out his attributes, and uh, they have sought to describe the Bible to us and, and, and uh, help us to study the Bible. We have universities, we have theological colleges, we have theological seminaries, we have commentaries on the Bible. But you know, really, we're only scratching the surface. We never could fully understand. We, with human minds, can f never fully comprehend what God is like. The psalmist says, His knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain unto it. But you know, we have got to realize that we have a God who is all-powerful. First of all, we have a God who is all-knowing. God who is all-seeing, a God who is all-wise. There's a theological uh, uh, phrase for that. He's omniscient. God who is all-knowing. He understands and he sees. 
verses 12 to 14 in the passage we read. He says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, meted out the heavens with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, weighing the mountains and scales and the hills in the balance? Who hath directed his spirit, the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor has taught him? In other words, he said, Nobody has been able to teach me, for I know exactly what's going on. You see, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, they were there as slaves to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. And they had uh, great oppression. Uh, and in Exodus 3, and verse 7, it says this, And the Lord said, I surely have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. You see, God knows all our our sorrows. And in Deuteronomy 2, verse 7, after the children of Israel had gone through the wilderness, Moses was about to leave the children of Israel. And and Deuteronomy is is, is that Moses' speech to them. And he says this, For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. You see, God knows. God knew their needs. So the great God that we worship this morning knows all about you. He knows all about me. He knows all who are in the building here this morning. He knows all who are listening at home. He knows all about us. He knows our very next breath. He knows our hearts. He understands us. His wisdom is past finding out. It's like a loving, caring parents, and those who are not parents yet might not understand this, but if you're a parent, you will know your children. And if there's something wrong, they don't have to tell you. You already know. If there's a problem in the family with the children, you'll know because Parents seem to have that way of just knowing that things aren't right. Well, we have a heavenly father who knows far more than any any human parents. And he understands us and he knows when we face difficulties. We have a God who knows and sees us. But not only that, we have a God who uh, possesses complete, unlimited, universal power and authority. He's the creator of the ends of the earth, verse 28 tells us. And he neither faints nor is weary. Isaiah in chapter 66, verse 1, he says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? Where is the place for my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. You know, it is amazing that we have a God who knows and understands us, sees us, is all wise. We also have a God who's all authority. Although he is all powerful, although he is almighty, although he sits upon the circle of the earth and controls everything, yet, yet we can come into his holy presence. We especially see this when he already knows and understands who we are. You see, God knows our failures. He knows our weaknesses. He knows that we were made of dust, but yet he loved us and he cares for us. And he's with us all of the time. Matthew 28 and verse 8 says, Jesus came and spoke unto them and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We have a God who's almighty, all powerful. We have also a God who is present with us all of the time. He's continuously and simultaneously present throughout the whole of the, his creation. He's continuously simply means he's continuing without change without stopping, without interrupting. It never stops. His presence with us never stops. 
Simultaneously simply means it's happening across the universe. Psalm 79, verse 5, Psalmist says, The hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. You know, his presence goes out throughout all the earth. His presence is so fully and wonderfully that, that the hills even melt at his presence. And Proverbs 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. We cannot hide from God. Yes, we may be able to hide things from our wife. You may be able to hide things from your husband. You may be able to hide things from your friends, from other church members, or whatever the case may be. You can hide things from other people. But we can hide nothing from God. He sees all of our hearts. He understands us. And he knows those that are his. He is a God who knows and sees us. But not only is he described as a God who sees all and knows all, is all powerful, and is continually with us, but he's described as the everlasting God. Verse 28 again says, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. In fact, this is one of Isaiah's uh, hobby horses, if you like, or one of his main themes throughout the whole uh, prophecy, uh, the everlasting God. For Isaiah 9, he, he described uh, Jesus as the everlasting Father. Verse, Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He is the Everlasting One, the Endless One, the Changeless One, the Perpetual One, the Continuous One, the Permanent One. We have an amazing, and a wonderful, incredible, and amazing God. How does an, in, uh, an infinite mind like us, who are temporary, who are on the scene of time for, for a short spell and then gone, how do we fully understand God? It's difficult for us. But God gives us that grace and help. God helps us in that he, he knows us, he sees us, and he is the one who will help us. Then to think that he is the one that gave his only son, the Lord Jesus, so that he would die on that cross for us. It's absolutely amazing. And we do sing that hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. that saved a wretch like me, and once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. To think that this all-knowing God knew the kind of people that we were, and yet he loved us. And we come to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as Lord and Savior. It's wonderful and amazing to know the, that assurance that all is forgiven. The all see and I of God sees us, but he forgives us. He never, ever leaves us, not even for one second. Matthew 28 and verse 20 says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What is your perception of God this morning? What is your awareness of God? What is your discernment of God? What is your view or opinion of God this morning? The more we think we know, the more we try to learn, we realize that there's still more to go. Our feeble minds could never fully comprehend the full attributes of God. When you consider the omniscient, the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the everlasting, Sovereign, loving, gracious, merciful God. What is your reaction? My reaction is this. As we sing sometimes in the hymn, By and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, thorn shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. More of my life than I ever gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. That is my thought when I consider the great God that I have. I'll wish I had given him more. One of the things the Bible uses to point us to the greatness of God is 
is creation around us. The wonder of creation. Verse 28 again. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God's purpose for the wonder of creation is to give us proof of his existence. Romans 1 and verse 20 it says this, For since the crea- creation of the world, his, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his everlasting power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, dear friend, if you're not saved, if you're listening to my voice this morning, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are left without excuse because the creation speaks for itself. Heaven tells of the glory of God and the firmament. The sky shows its handiwork. If you go out into the sky at night and look up, you will see the handiwork of God. But man has used creation to try and show that God does not exist. The fact is that without God, man is unable to fully comprehend or explain the universe. They have tried on numerous occasions to, to count the stars and still they're counting. They tried to count the galaxies and still they're counting. They can't comprehend, they fully, can't fully comprehend the, the full uh, honest and, and the awareness of, of, of the universe. More and more scientists are, are beginning to accept the fact that there is some design behind creation. We call it intelligent design. But they're reluctant to say that this is God, the God of heaven. This is our God. This is the God who has all power and all glory and all authority. See, the wonder of creation has baffled many because they're still learning. They could never fully plumb the depths of the sea. They could never fully understand the, the uh, oneness of, of, the, of the universe and the sky above us. So it has confounded many of the scientists when we consider our God, the one who created all them things, the one, the one that we worship this morning, the wonder of his creation. What importance does God's greatness mean to us. You know, we as Christians, those of us who know and love the Lord as our Savior, sometimes fear comes. We often face fears and trials and problems and difficulties that seems to almost overwhelm us. Sometimes fear and apprehension of the future grips the heart and soul of God's people. Sometimes it is understandable. We all have our fears of what's going to happen. Many today is the fear of COVID-19. As you talk to people, all they're interested in is avoiding COVID-19. There's a fear of contacting COVID-19. But there's no fear of their soul. When we consider the sin and wickedness that is propagated as right and proper in our land here, we get fearful of the future. And you know, sometimes in our, in our individual circumstances, we face those fears. As people think about this COVID-19, there's all sorts of fears, not only of contacting the virus, but there's fear for their family. There's a fear that they'll not be able to provide for their families because of businesses closing down, because of losing their jobs, because of finances. There's all sorts of fears. And those fears are real to God's people. But you know, we have a God who's able to provide for us. God says in his word here, in chapter 41, in verse 10, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Then in verse 13, he says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand. Imagine the God of heaven 
been able to hold us by the right hand. That is absolutely amazing that God should even think of us to do that. And say to, say to you, fear not, for I will help you. Verse 14 says, fear not, you warm Jacob. You men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord. He can help us to overcome those mountains in our lives, those fears in our lives that would try to hinder us, would try to curtail us, and sometimes would try to destroy us. Those difficulties and trials that will pull us down. As we read here in Isaiah 40 and verse 4, Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places made plain. You know what? We have a God who does that. Often our view of God is brought low by the size of the mountain before us. What is your mountain this morning? What is your fears this morning? It's like driving along the road and you have a, one of them massive lorries in front of you. And if you're too close to the lorry, you'll, it's a danger to try and overtake. But if you stay back from the lorry, you can see up each side and see what vehicle is coming and you can pass safely. Our mountains are like that. If we step back from our fears, step back from our, from our difficulties, and just see the God that we have, just comprehend the, 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 the amazing God that we have, then our mountains will become smaller. So the further you get back from the lorry, the smaller the lorry is. And so it is with, with our fears. If we step back from our fears, Keep our eyes fixed upon the Lord. He will, he will, he will sort out the matter. If we could back, step back from those problems, those mountains, and, and then God will help us. It's like a hymn that Reverend William McRae often sang, and I'm sure you, you know it. God, my God is bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my fears. God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. Bigger than any, all my questions. Bigger than all my fears. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all the shadows that fall across my path. God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. He's bigger than all the confusion. Bigger than any, anything. God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. Bigger than all the giants of pain and unbelief. God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. Bigger than any hang-ups, bigger than anything. My God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. When we begin to focus on God's greatness, it causes us to realize that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We need to, as God's people, to depend totally on the greatness of God. But finally, we see the importance of God's greatness for the sinner. Regardless of whether the sinner realizes this or not, they are helpless and hopeless. There is nothing the sinner can do to save himself or keep himself out of that place called hell. Not a thing we can do. We are saved by grace, not by works. Sin is a cruel taskmaster. Its reward is death, an eternal separation from God forever and ever. Romans tells us the wages of sin is death. And that's the result of a sinful life. In that place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. God's greatness for the sinner is this that he looks upon them with love. And he calls them to himself. He's not willing that any should perish. And Isaiah 45, 22 says, Look unto me, be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Acts 4, verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Same thought as Isaiah. 
He is God, and there is none else that we can turn to. God's call of salvation is universal. God is so great that if people simply look to him, turn from their sin, turn from from the wickedness, and look to him and trust in him, and ask him to forgive them for their sin, repent of their sin, and ask for forgiveness, he will forgive them. He will save them. That's because Jesus Christ, his precious son, died for the sin, for your sin and mine. He died to take away our sin. Because he lives, we can live also. So in conclusion, we have an all-seeing, all-wise, eternal God, dear friends. When we consider the wonder of creation, it reminds us of God's greatness. It reminds us of his love and the way he has provided for us. It reminds us of his care, his compassion, his grace and mercy. When we consider the importance of God's greatness for the believer, it reminds us of the fact that he knows our fears, he knows our problems, and he is there to help. When we consider the importance of God's greatness for the sinner, you must realize that this is a holy, righteous God who cannot look on sin. Sin separates from God forever unless it's dealt with. But if you repent and trust in this amazing God, what we have been talking about, then he will take you in. He will forgive your sin and you can become one of his children. I trust that these thoughts will be a blessing to you and that the Lord will speak to all of us through this. Thank you very much for listening. We're going to